Oops, here. Okay, perfect. So first I'd like to really welcome everybody for, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is PJ Dillon and I'm an assistant professor of management at Andavira Institute for Ethics and Business affiliated researcher at Duquesne University. And I'm also the current board president for the US chapter of EMA. And I really just wanted to thank everybody for being here and helping us work towards supporting a society that promotes organizing practices um, that honor the inherent value of all life and really work at protecting uh, dignity. Um, and I'm very grateful to have Sandra Waddick here leading us with the Intellectual Shaman series. Um, and Sandra is the Galligan Chair of Strategy, a Carroll School Scholar of Corporate Responsibility, and a Professor of Management at Boston College's Carroll School of Management. So thank you, Sandra, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you, PJ, um, and Erica, and Michael, and Ariane, and everyone else who's in the background. Um, um, here. So I'm, uh, as, as most of you probably know by now, um, the Intellectual Shaman series helps to uh, frame research and teaching and the kinds of things we do as professors and faculty members um, in, a, in a slightly different way, really focusing on impact and how we can all move towards pathways that allow us to um, achieve that impact. And so I like to invite people who have done that in their careers to talk and reflect about their careers and about their activities and why they've chosen some of the topics that they've chosen. And I'm absolutely thrilled today to be introducing Bobby Banerjee. Bobby is professor of management um, at the um, uh, Bayes Business School, City University of London. And he just, I believe, stepped down from being associate dean of research and enterprise there. Um, he researches and teaches on corporate social irresponsibility, unsustainability, climate justice, and decolonial resistance movements. Bobby's a real iconoclast, and I think you'll enjoy listening to him. He's published widely in international journals ranging from the Academy of Management, Learning, and Education to Business and Society to Business Ethics Quarterly, Human Relations, and uh, the list goes on. He's the author of two books. Corporate Social Responsibility, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, maybe we can talk about that, and the co-edited volume, Organizations, Markets, and the Imperial Formations Towards an Anthropology of Globalization. He was senior editor at Organization Studies for more than 10 years, a dozen years in fact, and is currently associate editor at Business and Society. I love this part of his bio. Prior to becoming an academic, Bobby was a real person and worked for uh, US and European multinational corporations in the chemicals industry, where as sales manager, he was responsible for overseeing the selling and import of chemicals that were banned in the US and Europe to developing countries. In the little spare time he has today, Bobby dreams of destroying global neoliberal capitalism. So I think you're gonna enjoy hearing from Bobby. He is not your uh, usual, um, run-of-the-mill academic, and um, I'm really thrilled that he's here. So, Bobby, um, I think you said you were going to give us a bit of an introduction to some of your work. Yeah. First of all, thanks so much for inviting me. When I saw the, when I first saw the invite, I was on, on my phone, and the last part of the sentence had been cut off, and what I was reading was, we would like you to talk about an intellectual sham, and it's, oh my God, I've been discovered. And so <laughs> fortunately I saw the shaman after that. I don't know if I'm a shaman, perhaps troublemaker might be a more appropriate word, if you, at least if you speak to my bosses over the years. So yeah, and, and look, thanks for coming folks. I mean, I'm assuming most people are on the East Coast. I know I'd rather be doing a lot of other things on a Friday evening than listening to Bobby Banerjee, but I uh, really appreciate your time. I'm just going to take a few minutes. This is not death by PowerPoint, just to give you an idea especially for those of you who don't know my work in terms of some of the broad areas. And, and also, I guess, for the benefit of the younger scholars here, some of the difficulties, uh, you know, structural difficulties in doing the work which some of us want to do and still, I guess, have a reasonably successful publishing career. It's, it's, it's a hard grind. So um, let me just share this uh, with you. Uh, Can you guys see the screen? Yeah, someone say something? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, it looks good. But, yeah, so let me start with, I guess, three broad areas. And since I 
uh, my post PhD work, uh, I did my PhD at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst on sustainability, actually. And I think the first sentence of a PhD written in 94, 95, had the word climate change before, quote unquote, it became hot. Uh, so the broad area would be this. On, again, I don't, I'm not going to go through the papers, but on sustainability, the reason I'm putting this from going back to 2000 and 2001, where I just started my career, is you'll see that there's an interesting gap. So my initially, there's a flurry of papers coming out on sustainability. And there's a kind of a gap for 10 years. And that's when I realized I had lost the battle. That movement had been hijacked by, by the strategy people. It had been hijacked uh, by, by big business. So, and Sandra, as very well will know, when, when one started off, I was a PhD student uh, when one started off at the academy as an interest group. And over the years, I saw it slowly becoming more and more mainstream till the fact that when the academy had, after years of lobbying, a special, I mean, a theme on the greening of industry, I forget which year it was, I had nothing to say. I had no paper on sustainability. And now it's, I guess, coming back in the more critical perspective, especially on stuff like degrowth and climate change. Uh, because as far as I'm concerned, the sustainability battle has been lost and it has been won by, by the mainstream uh, scholars. Uh, Sarai, Urjin, Andy, and I wrote a paper in Oak Studies last year, precisely making that point. And in somewhat of a, of a half a joke, I said, I don't have the empirical data, but here's my theoretical proposition. The more research that is published on sustainability by business school scholars, the worse the environmental problems are going to get. Uh, again, somebody has time on their hands, they can do an empirical study. And I have a strong theoretical basis for that. So that's one broad area. The second one is mainly or, or critical on, on CSR, um, on broadly issues of governance. But, but may, this one, the unit of analysis is the political economy. Very few of my papers actually look at the organization per se, because I think expecting change from a single organization in this political economy is futile. If there is has to any progressive change, it would have to be at the political economy level. So I would say 99% of my papers, empirical or theoretical, most of my work is theoretical, focuses at this level at the political economy. So I look at resistance movements, uh, I look at governance issues, uh, CSR also, the paper and the book, is pretty much at the political economy level, uh, not, not at the uh, individual organizational level. Then a third uh, theme is on uh, uh, post-colonial decolonial studies movements, and it's also linked with some of the work I do with indigenous communities. I worked with Aboriginal communities in Australia. Uh, I don't publish out of that. Um, those are mainly action research participatory action, uh, projects. And the reason I don't publish out of that is I don't want to be part of that extractive economy, uh, you know, build my career based on, on indigenous you know, well, dispossession. Uh, those are mainly practical projects, but I do publish out of the, some of the critical perspectives which I see from ethnography or on my reading, or simply just talking to tribal people all over the world, whether it's in Canada, South America, Asia, uh, Africa, Australia. Uh, uh, the latest, I guess, one, which is the one on all theory, where we, we look at this, this notion of, of Gaia, which is really you know, supposed to be saving the world. And we basically say, you know, there were communities which knew this 30,000 years ago. It represents a breakthrough in Western social science only 15 years ago. And we were arguing about, about the silences there. And most of the critiques of received wisdom are, I do from a decolonial perspective. So this call is really hard and I'll come to why in a minute, because this is not scholarship which you would expect business people to know very well. And you can understand why I get rejected. Why would somebody want to entertain a paper when the entire literature is completely outside management, outside business, outside economics, right? So it's really hard to bring in this perspective from a completely different uh, disciplinary perspective, from a different epistemological perspective. And that's the kind of, of, of difficulty uh, you know, I faced throughout my career. And the last, this is where it's getting more and more frequent. TTPMO stands for things that piss me off. And as I grow older, I think I get angrier or perhaps just more things that piss me off. And I see something in the news, I get really angry and then I write something about it. So the latest one, which should be published, what year is this? 20? It should be published either January 23. It is a critique about the representation of the war in Ukraine and why all of us have been asked to condemn that war with the same government institutions that are asking me to condemn the war with responsibility for countless wars, uh, which for, for some reason escaped to scrutiny. me. Uh, I talk about COVID and climate change as well and uh, modern slavery. 
so that's the kind of stuff which does not really have a theme, so to speak. Uh, it's perhaps not sustainability, but these these are tend to be events which I see happening, and which which I get really angry about. And I say, okay, can we put a, a scholarly uh, veneer around that anger? Yeah. And and kind of uh, and uh, and I'm sure you'll admit there's a lot to be angry angry about in the world we're living in today. Uh, in terms of where I'm, what I'm doing now, I'm on, I'm on a one-year sabbatical, as I, Sandra said. I've stepped down as an associate dean. I've paid my dues to society. They've now let me out, so I'm a free man. Um, I am just developing a project. This will be a major one. It will involve some serious funding. Looking at rural communities in uh, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, Bangladesh, Tunisia, Morocco, India, who've been affected by climate change, uh, climate impacts, and see what kind of sustainable livelihoods are possible on that place they're staying. What happens is the alternative is they have to leave their place and end up in the cities as wage laborers, uh, you know, sex, sex trafficking, uh, just generally work as an underclass in the big cities, but at least here they had some level of agency which is going away because of climate change. So what kind of uh, livelihoods was possible uh, which allowed them to stay in a two degrees temperature hotter world? Uh, hotter world? The second one is this is a project, this is, this is a special issue which we are just writing on the due, the due date is 31st October, the Journal of Management Studies, looking at um, indigenous relations to land, uh, which are in, on indigenous ontologies to land, which is very different from our extractive uh, transaction relationship with land, and to see if we would come up with some kind of a financial instrument which reflects those kind of values. The last two are theoretical papers, just beginning to work on this notion which was developed in the 80s on racial capitalism. So for example, this, this, I don't know if she's here or not, she, Michael Walter had sent her the link. We're looking at, in a particular context, the farm workers in Florida and trying to trace the transformation from slaves to stakeholders. Uh, so we are going, uh, going back to some archival data during the plantation days uh, and they're seeing some of the continuities uh, at the end of slavery and also not even modern slavery and the resistance movements in the, in, in, in amongst the farm workers and seeing the continuations of uh, continuations of narratives between slaves and between stakeholders, what really has changed? And that's the second part is also that uh, the, uh, connected to that is the decolonial movements, which essentially are in the mining industry. So I study uh, violent mining conflicts and most of them are in Latin America. So I've written a few of that. There's some ongoing as well. Now here's the problem. I'm gonna end with this and especially for, I guess, a warning for the PhD students or younger scholars, when you know that you're going to be in trouble. Out of curiosity, I looked at every paper I've written in the, five year, the last five years, and I looked at the keywords. Okay, before before I okay before I go into that, just to tell you, in some of the pushback when you get when you try to do this kind of work, I'm not going to name the journal. But let's put it this way: it's an allegedly four-star elite journal. This is the comment I got once in rejecting. This is rejected for one revision because I refused to play that game. Now, this is a remarkable statement. Obviously, this statement has no ideology. Yeah? So market-based measures, there's no ideology. That's kind of natural, right? But because I'm critiquing that, I was critiquing microfinance in there, then that was the only thing they could focus on. And this is a kind of, of uh, barrier, structural barriers, we will come up with anyone who does this kind of work has to face. I have a very impressive list of rejections, uh, more than I think everybody in this room put together. Right, so as I said, I, was, I went through, out of curiosity, every paper I wrote in the last five years and picked up some keywords. These are my keywords, yeah? I'm gonna just, just take a look, just to show where, and don't forget, I'm a business school professor. Uh, and out of curiosity, I looked at AMR, AMJ, and ASQ, and SMJ in the last five years, same about, and these are their keywords. You see the problem? This is not my audience. They're not what I, they don't want to hear what I have to say, right? Now, how does then one bridge this gap, uh, given the fact that th this is the kind of, of, of uh, structural barriers that you have, right? You know that, I'm, I know that I'm in trouble is after I finish a paper, I look at my bibliography, 95% are from outside business. Which journal is going to even begin to? take that seriously, right? They, they, they all say, oh, this is fantastic. This is truly original. This is important. This is incredible work. You have blown me away, but 
what's the implications for, for management theory, right? So that's always been my biggest battle is to make that hook in uh, while they say the problem is important, it's critical, it's going to save the world, but, right? Is the but what you come from? This is the but, this is this and that. Right, so that's the kind of constant battle I've had since my PhD days, which hasn't gone away. I might be a senior professor. I just got rejected two weeks ago by Journal of Management after two revisions again. Same problem, that uh, there's not enough implications for quote unquote management theory. So I leave it at that, and uh, let Sandra ask me some difficult questions. Well, I'm sorry, difficult, but and I would um, ask anyone who has a question for Bob to please put yeah, it in the chat, ahead, yeah. and we're um, we're, we're gonna get to your, your questions um, as soon as we possibly can. Um, um, I, I, I just wanna sort of pick up where you left off, Bobby, the link to management theory. It seems to me the, the real problem that you're raising here is that there's an issue with management theory. Can you maybe speak to that issue? Yes, and the, you're absolutely right. I suddenly realized there's nothing wrong with me. Maybe there's something wrong with the theory. People are rejecting me. You're right, and so that, uh, point counterpoint paper I, I spoke about, I wrote about in general management studies. Management theory, at least in terms of where I come from, is until very recently, is race neutral, right? Org theory. It is uh, uh, almost race does not exist or is neutral. The, ge the gender, there's been a lot more work in the last 25 years, okay? It is also silent completely about its complicity in uh, colonial forms of extraction, uh, you know, Capital, without colonialism, there would not be any capital, capitalism, right? You take the three uh, factors of production, which any economics textbook will tell you, right? Land, labor, capital. Look at land and look at labor. So between slavery and between the theft of land of 400 years of colonialism, that was the basis of capitalism, right? We don't talk about that, right? Most, so I guess what I do is show A, what these silences are, why do they exist? And what can we do to, I guess, unsilence it? Everybody knows Frederick Taylor's principles of scientific management. <clears throat> How many of us know that those principles were directly derived from the plantations? He studied the, the, in terms of how they kept it. To the extent that modern means of motivating productivity is actually hasn't changed that much. So what the plantation owners would do is that they would have a contest for the maximum number of cotton that slaves could pick. Right, and the winner would get uh, a few dollars, a day off, you know, go off to town somewhere. There'll be a prize awarded to the winners. That then became the minimum amount each slave should produce. Yeah, it also was used to calculate the number of whips, strokes of the whip they would get if they did not meet the minimum amount. That is the principle of scientific management. Why is that not there in any textbook? Yeah, why? And it's it's. I found it within ten minutes of going through the records. Right? So it's not that this is un, uh, uh, knowledge which is not out there. It's very well documented. Right? It's only now people are trying to talk about it. Right? Where is the mention of, of, of uh, historical slavery as a factor, as a competitive advantage for labor? So those are the things I say management theory has been silent about. And the question is perhaps now is the time to start a, asking those difficult questions. Yeah. But how do we do that, Bobby, when the journals do what just happened to you last two weeks ago? Yeah, I know. I mean, how do how do we? Sh I I get so frustrated because I'm working on system transformation mm -hmm. myself, and I look at the journals and think, okay, and then I look at the keywords just like you did, although mm -hmm. I didn't do an analysis of them, and there's no keyword at all that relates to anything yeah. I'm interested in. Yeah, and and that's the problem. I think our uh, it's ideology. That's all it is. Uh, you know, I, because I think our our. Uh, gatekeepers of knowledge, and yes, I am one of them as well. I mean, I've been editor of a journal for what, 20 years now, are I think uncomfortable with system level change. It's not what we are trained to, we don't, that, that's not how we were trained. Our training is very functional, very narrow, right? So until we get that out of our system, I don't think anything, anything going to change. People are happy to talk about corporate sustainability, right? But if we talk about system sustainability, then you start saying, no, oh, no, no, I start glazing over. I think they feel threatened. I think it's very a valid point that, uh, you know, I know people might not like this and people just say, well, do you see any hope in a business school? I said, no. I mean, you know, we are turning out, turning out the next generation of skilled criminals in business schools. You know, the, how many people have gone to jail in the last financial crisis? Which is caused by whom? Caused by people who taught, right? 
How many people have gone to jail? Some trillions of dollars of, 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 of law. You can give, go to jail in Texas for, you know, for five years for having a joint in your pocket. And the people who caused the biggest disruption in the planet, their bonuses are back. Yeah. So I think there's partly that, there's partly being a major self-defensiveness that, oh, you know, that we try and blame everybody else. Oh, it's corrupt government, so, you know, this thing, but not ourselves. So I think we need to have a very strong critical look at ourselves and see what we are actually churning out. Yeah, yeah, and then that speaks to the issue of the ability to even think about systems, um, yeah. and which is, is um, for many, I think many, even many good scholars is completely lacking. And, you know, I mean, how do you learn to do that, to think in these really bigger picture ways that, that make some of the links that we need to make? Yeah, and th it is hard. I mean, I, I, without doubt, it is hard, but, but we are scholars, right? I mean, if things are easy for us, then we're not doing our job. It has to be hard. We have to be asking the hard questions. We have to be looking at the, at, at the more challenging ones. I mean, the other problem is this is where ideology gets back. I mean, all the Cold War has been over for so long, but I don't know, the US still has some kind of hangover, I think. There was a talk I gave, a keynote I gave some time ago, I forget where, uh, where I was critiquing that you cannot solve, address climate justice and climate change under a political economy of capitalism. I hate using the C word because it just becomes too ideological. So then I become very specific. Moment you say capitalism, people say, oh my God, you use the C word. So I said, all right, can you address carbon reduction through a system of private property rights? Right? Can you address climate change through a system of competitive relations? So I focus on those specific aspects rather than talk about capitalism. Right now, and again, I, I'm uh, so somebody's uh, the usual. What's your alternative? I said the democratic socialism is not an alternative either because they have the same growth model. So as I ask myself, does the planet really care if it's being destroyed by capitalists or socialists? Right? Even the socialist model it still has an endless growth model. Yeah, the difference is the profits might go to the state but you're still using the same economic extraction model, right? You're still assuming that this growth can go on forever and have this magical thing called green growth, which is an oxymoron, right? So those, those are the systems which, uh, which we really need to be attacking, but uh, we don't have the vocabulary in our field or the imagination or the courage. You've done this type of work since the beginning of your career. Where did you find that courage and what motivated you to um, actually Work well, and move in this I tell you, my that's one of the left. That's one of the reasons I left the U.S. I don't normally admit this, except after a few drinks. My PhD is actually in marketing, believe it or not. So apparently, my PhD resistance, the paper which I don't even read, but everybody gets excited about, is the Journal of Marketing paper. It's a straightforward paper. It's not. It's not I don't. It's not a critical paper. It's a fine paper, but it's not very interesting. You know, it's, this is. Basically, it was a structural equation model of what US companies were doing and why they were doing it. So yeah, I, I guess what I thought was mainstream, my American colleagues, US colleagues thought was too radical. And I was just sick and tired of playing that game. Now in Europe, there is, and in Australia especially, there is some acceptance, if you will, reluctant or otherwise, of alternative scholarship. I think partly because uh, a lot of the business school uh, professors or academy in the US come from economics background or industrial economics or strategy backgrounds, right? In Europe, there a lot of them are, what I'd like to say, failed sociologists in a way, and they make a shitload more money in a business school than they would in a sociology department. So I think there's a, and, and Australia is a country which is so far away, they're just desperate for any kind of international attention. So as long as I publish in the top journals, and you know, international journal, they don't really care what work I do. They just want, you know, they're, they're, university out in the international stuff. So, but I found the space which I created for myself and I found would have been very, very difficult for me to do in the US. I think there would be, a, most of my American colleagues are mystified that why I haven't been fired yet. Uh, and they told me straight off, you're in my school, you get fired straight off with what I do, right? So the tenure list in most of, I'm not even talking about the Ivy League, let's forget that. They're not in my league anyway. But even the top, whatever, the next level, the tenure list, Maybe I'll hit one or two of those journals every year. You know, that's about it. But more important is what I have to do to hit those journals is something I've never compromised on. I've got, I think in my entire life, which sounds strange, I've submitted once to AMR. It got rejected after two revisions because I refused to do what they wanted me to do. And that became my CSR good, the bad, the ugly paper. 
which has more citations published in a sociology journal, it has more citations than every single acad academic paper put together. So which is better now for me, an AMR just because to say an AMR or the impact is under talked about, right? So yeah, it is, it's, it's a constant battle. Um, there is, a, and again, I, I mean, imagine when I started off, there was no such thing as a critical journal. Uh, there's a lot more space now, uh, thanks to the beatings we've taken for the younger generation to actually do this stuff. Uh, I do these uh, uh, workshops uh, for PhD students in the academy and uh, in, in EGOS, you know, to see 30, 40 people doing the dissertation on sustainability was unimaginable at my time. And I was told by my very well-meaning dissertation chair that what I was doing was professional suicide. He said, nobody will touch you. He actually, he meant it well. He said, you know, you're one of the brightest people you've recruited. What are you doing is suicide, don't do it. It's kind of nice when you prove your professors wrong because I saw that movement coming. The green movement in the US, in the West, started off as a very anti-business grassroots movement. Think of hippies, 60s, 70s, right? Very, very grassroots, very radical. Then came, came, came the 80s, kind of vanished. I saw it, I was on the cusp. I moved to the US in 1990. And I saw it coming back, but I saw it coming back in corporate terms because people had realized if we didn't get this shit together, we're gonna to be in deep trouble. So I saw a very different spin of it uh, on it, which is why, although my thesis is quantitative, I did I had to do a lot of interviews to actually find out what is happening on the ground. And again, because there was no literature and management, most of the people I cite are environmental sociologists or psychologists uh, or economists in there. So that movement, the 90s environmental movement was a multinational environmental movement. And unfortunately, that's where, that's where we still are. Yeah. Um, there is a, a very interesting conversation going on in the chat. Yeah, I'm just looking at it um, now. Yeah, the talks, it's, it, it, it's Michael, uh, Michael Pearson mentioned humanistic management journal. Uh, Michael, you want to say a couple words about that? Really? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I got uh, Bobby's commitment, and I think many of us are here, and, and some of us are in more senior positions, and others are maybe starting. I think there are journals out there, as Bobby, as you're saying, that are not necessarily the traditional journals, and if there are sufficient amount of people that want to publish something that the traditional journals don't publish, there is a space where they can be published, they will not necessarily fit the criteria that people are typically looking for if they're just careerist. But if they have a, uh, an, an interest in making the impact or talking about the topics that Sandra and Bobby are talking about, um, I just wanna make sure that, that people are aware of these other outlets. We founded that journal precisely because of that reason. And one of the reasons I did that at the time was I heard Michael Jensen who many of you might know as one of the more influential traditional <laughs> economists say, you know, they didn't get their stuff into their journal, so they started a journal. Mm. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to put this out there um, that there is a both and. You can publish those things and you can play the game if you need to do that to fit into the other things, if that's... Yeah, the, the, other, the other strategy, which is also becoming very, very uh, popular and gives an opening is special issues. Uh, and they tend to be a little bit more out there. Now, for example, I'll give you again, but again, the backlash is, is just completely unbelievable, the backlash. Journal of Management Studies, in fact, that's what I'm working on right now, I have an October 31 deadline. JMS, which is a very, very mainstream journal, it is by no means a critical radical journal, right? They have a special issue on, I'll try to be very clever with the title, Atlas Unplug on Rethinking Capitalism. And I know those special issue editors, you know, I know their work, very critical people. I was a shocked that JMS would even consider something this pleasantly shocked. I know the editor, I'm not going to mention any names. So I was having some issues with JMS. I was publishing my that paper I was talking about. Some of the authors I was critiquing, they didn't like it. So we're going back and forth about how politically you want to get. But he was a very supportive editor, and pretty much everything I wanted to say got in without being, or shall I put it, sanitized scholarly in a scholarly way. And he was telling me then that issue came out. Again, I'm not going to. I asked him to tell me, at least forward me the email, but he was a very ethical editor. He said, no, I will not forward you. He said 10 of the biggest names in the US in our field wrote to the journal editor, the main editor in chief saying, "What this is, withdraw the special issue at once. This is an anti-capitalist uh, special issue. It does not belong. I'm not kidding you. I thought he was joking. 
And he said, no, we had to actually make him. And he's, he's laughing. He says, what? I mean, what? This is an academic journal. Ten of the biggest names in our field have written to the journal saying this is taking a special issue out. If that's not gatekeeping, if that's not ideology, if that's not pettiness, I don't know what it is. Did we lose Sandra? PJ? Sandra, my God, the same thing happened to us in the Academy Symposium. <laughs> Sandra just got knocked out. There she is. Is yeah. she back? Uh, I no. see a tile of her name. Yeah. That's so maybe, weird. Maybe, maybe in the meantime, Anne, if you're there, do you want to share what the initiative that you're referring to? Anne Sui? Thank you, Michael. I'm happy to, but I don't want to take the time of Bobby. I'm, I'm happy just to type a few notes on the side, but if you really want me to, I'm always happy to talk about RVM, but it's your call. Yeah, I'm just Bobby, I'm curious, are you, are you, have you heard about RVM? Yes, I do. I, I, yeah. management? I was, I was, I was at one of the workshops. Oh, good. One of the okay. online workshops. I was, I think they had a facilitator or something. And I was one of them. So yeah, yeah. I, uh, Sandra's back, I see. No, she's gone again. I just saw her coming. But I share your frustration very mm. much with the current system mm. and the frustration about how difficult it is to change. We have senior scholars, mid scholars, junior scholars, all wanting and putting in time and effort, but still, um, the, 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 the current system is so well ingrained. So many influential scholars are gatekeeping and preventing the change. It's just yeah. almost impossible. I mean, the, um, the other option, and Andy Hoffman is a good example of this. Uh, but again, this problem is our reward systems are not structured. Mm -hmm. that way. Andy right. said, screw the journals. I'm just going to write books. And you have but, that much more freedom with the book. The problem is, Books are not on the tenure list for most business schools, right? So he, he could do that now that he's a full. Exactly. But when he yeah. when he was assistant, he published in the journals as well. Everybody so plays he, that game, right? You have that's to. what I'm saying. Those systems have to be changed at the grassroots level if we really want something to happen. But again, yeah. who's going to take that call to be able to do that, right? So see that there it is. That's it. That's 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 key. Who is going to do that? But even we have hundreds of senior scholars and junior scholars wanting yeah. to do that, willing to take the risk to do that. But yeah. there are thousands and thousands of the people on the other yeah, side. And, yeah, and I think that's what I guess, you know, the, the, the cynic, or, well, people describe me as a cynic. I said, no, I'm a realist. There's a difference. Uh, is that I guess what keeps me going despite all these frustrations is when I see the next generation of scholars, I see the passion, and I see, okay. and, I, and, I, and I also see that what I tell them is they are going to destroy our passion. This is a soul. Publishing a journal in one of our four-star alleged papers is a soul-destroying process, as anyone can tell you. So I just yeah. tell them. To that. me, to me, it's it unethical, yeah. uh, not humane to use yeah. our young scholars' yeah. right minds in writing yeah. papers for yeah. instrumental purposes and not for scholarship. So I think Michael's want to talk. So. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I guess <laughs> this is the this is the transition I had, and this is this is how horrible our field is in terms of trying to, to even encourage people. You know, as a reviewer, what happens? Well, the first thing I get as a reviewer when I see a paper, the first question I ask is, how do I reject this paper? What is wrong with this paper? I never ask what's right with it. And that is such a horrible way to look at the world, right? Now, as an editor, that hat has shifted. I look at this paper and I said, you know what? Can I make this paper in a way that people will cite this after 20 years? And it's a completely different way, and, 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 as, and uh, as Anne obviously you know, but this is more for the benefit of the younger people. First thing we do is, what's wrong with this paper? We never ask what's right with it, whether I get a dissertation to, to, to mark or anything else. And I think making that shift is really important. Uh, and that, I think, just came with, with experience and we had to be able to do this. And Michael, you have your hand yeah. up. Ah, yeah. okay, Sandra. Yeah, no, no, uh, it's great that you're back. So I just, just- Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. My computer decided to act up. Sandra, I had this feeling of deja vu. It happened to us in the academy as well. <laughs> yes, it did. That's right. 
so there's there's a comment from Dennis about Dennis. Don't get me. You, you are deliberately trying to bait me. Don't get me started on journal rankings. <laughs> you you've written the piece. You know you know the completely futility of this. I live I live in the UK. Yes, everybody does rankings. The UK has. I think they should get the country psychoanalyzed. I have a pathological obsession with leap <laughs> rankings. I have never seen a country like this. Yes, we all know the rankings, but it's taken to a different level. So. Yes, please. Uh, uh, you know, don't get me started. It's a it is a repressive system. It is a system in the guise of promoting excellence promotes mediocrity. It promotes more of the same, right? If I had to listen to the journal rankings, I would have to change what I did in my CSR paper, and and get into that journal, which obviously were completely defeated the point I was trying to make, right? So yeah, uh, but it's a game we play. So. I tell the younger students, you know, play that game, put one or two papers in your top journals, but make sure that you, the word you want to say is out somewhere. Yeah, right. and, and Michael, you still have your hand up. Did you want to make a comment or question? Yeah, no, I, I think because, yeah, I just wanted to sort of get back to possibility and not sort of, I think there's oftentimes, at least what resonates with me, oftentimes this fatalism, uh, we can't do anything, all the intellectual juice is going into explaining why we can't. <laughs> And I think that's sort of not what uh, I think this this is is about. It's like healing. What can can work? Sandra, you were getting your career going in a way that that didn't necessarily have that. I think Bobby, you too. Many of uh, the folks, um, I think myself included, I didn't even know about some of these limits. Maybe that's helpful. Um, and I just want to put out that you can make a career in that space when you do publish what you actually want to say. It may not necessarily be may not necessarily be that you're going to be at Harvard or you're going to go to Yale or all of these things. I think there's a lot of that careerism that's actually preventing us from making the difference we want to make. Um, and so, uh, and I have found that the big important conversations in the end, you're going to have a lot more impact than than just the traditional kind of AMJ thing. Um, so I want to put this back into maybe Bobby for you to react, um, Sandra, yourself. Yeah, Bobby. There's, there's just one thing I picked up in the chat. It's a very interesting point uh, uh, from by Leka Warrior about ESG. Leka, first of all, don't be scared of, of anything. It doesn't matter. About ESG, I'm so glad somebody raised this. ESG has become the new CSR. It is like more pernicious than CSR because it gives the illusion of performance. Uh, for ESG is the environment sustainability governance. Uh, again, and as this started off as a joke and it was scary. So I have an undergraduate uh, student who was doing her project uh, on, on ESG and, uh, and actual performance. And it, just as a joke, I just said, you know what? There's lots of data available. I bet if you do a correlation, you will find that companies with the highest ESG scores are also the highest carbon emitters. And we both laughed at that. And guess what? That's exactly what we found in this. What makes ESG particularly pernicious is that it gives inaccurate and misleading investment uh, information to investors. What ESG is doing is incentivizing fossil fuel investments. Let me tell you, tell, tell, let me tell you how. So they'll come and say, oh, they've got these process factors. They've got, so Shell has got this, they've got that. And they're not actually giving the real information on standard assets. So what's happening is instead of an investor perhaps who could have invested in some more more radical and more uh, returns, which don't come in that quickly, they're going to go by these ratings, right? And give it to uh, companies or industries, which are really not doing anything except look pretty. And so it continues that business as usual, right? So this way, from a purely finance, actual science perspective, and I'm asking my finance colleagues, it's time for you guys to do this. This is actually giving inaccurate, criminally wrong information to investors. If this happened in any other, Form, whether it's a corruption or ethics or child labor, they'd be sued. But because it's ESG, you know, they just get away with it. This, this is, as I said, some, this, a major takedown is needed. So yeah, sorry about that, the rant. But let it, uh, what, Lata, it's an important question to ask. And if you're doing that stuff, by all means, go and just look, as you said, ESG performance has got nothing to do with sustainability performance. It's sad, sometimes the other way around. The worse the performer, the higher the ESG. Yeah, sorry. yeah, Bobby. I was I just before before we turn to other questions, uh, and there's a couple in, that are really. Uh, this is, I I know Anne Sui's on this call, and I I'm sorry I 
got kicked off. I think, Anne, you might have already commented, but did you want to add anything to what Bobby has just said? No. Okay. Um, Bobby, I wanted to ask you, you've talked a lot about the challenges of doing this kind of taking this unconventional iconoclastic, I like to call it, path. Um, it, but you and I and Michael and other people on this call, including Anne, have, have been able to do that successfully. So what are the joys of doing this? What are the rewards of, of doing this? Yeah, for me, the real joy is this. I mean, A, again, I'm not going to name this journal. I got rejected after two divisions. And I'm not kidding you. One of the comments was, I actually have the comment here somewhere, that you might want to consider a journal that is more, uh, what's the word, they use? amenable to, to, to critique than ours, right? My point is, and I'm a, by default, a member of critical management studies. There's a, I'm on the board of organization, which is the only critical journal. My point is, and I responded to the editor quite politely saying, I don't want to publish my work in a critical journal. It's preaching to the converted. It's your audience that is illiterate and needs to educate it. That's why I'm sending it there. Right. So the joy of being rejected five times and then one critical paper which gets into a mainstream journal without me having to compromise, that's one part of it. But secondly, as I said, it's it's working with the next generation of scholars uh, to be able to see that, uh, you know, what I uh, I was considered to be a freak to do, to go exactly, to do exactly the opposite of what advice I was given. But now that is somewhat mainstream, but to see the next generation doing this. And also doing some very critical work. Yes, I think that's the only thing that keeps me going. And we're also using my work as well to do that. And I think, again, I, I shall not name this university. Uh, there was a PhD student. She, he, she wasn't my student, but she was using a lot of my work. And her, super, her supervisor told her, citing Banerjee is a bad career move till you get tenure. Wait till you get tenure, then you cite Banerjee. Otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding you. <laughs> but again, it's good to see she didn't take that advice, right? So. Uh, going back to see that younger scholars are willing to, to take that risk, I think it's, it's a huge gratification from my side. Yeah, it, it, it really is rewarding when you see people who mm -hmm. are stepping out and, and doing this. Um, let me just, um, let's turn to some of the questions in the chat yeah, because the chat there's, well. there's so much going on there that, um, Rudolph, you had one of the first questions. You want to raise it? Or have we answered it? Are you still here, Rudolph? Here, yes, yes, yes. No, I'm. Uh, <laughs> thanks, uh, Bobby. You have published in CPUIB. Uh, uh, unfortunately, it seems that you are no longer keen to publish in critical journals, right? Uh, and I, I totally understand. So the the challenge that journal editors have uh, yeah. is really this this being pressured into that space in the UK, in particular, into that space whereby mm. you need to go to a three star in order to get the the papers flocking in, right? We are yeah. at the two star level, right? So we are a serious journal. We we have credits over a history uh, of uh, over fifteen years, but at the same time, uh, there is not enough quality work that comes in at the two star level because basically that doesn't give you a promotion, right? So oh, the oh, journals, oh. as a consequence, my journal, uh, CPOIB, Journal of uh, Critical Perspectives and International Business, is in, in effect exactly at this intersection. We need to get more papers in in order to get into the rankings. Uh, we need more people to to think along the lines of our editorial uh, policy to move then also up into that um, that legitimate space, which gives you promotion, which allows then more people to actually do the the, the, the work. So that's a very challenging proposition. Yeah, but, uh, any, I, yeah. Again, I, Rudolf, I mean, you know, I've published in that journal. I think I was on the board as well. So yeah, I completely sympathize. And, but this is the problem, you know, in this neoliberal hegemony of publishing, for those of you who don't know the UK system, is these three and alleged three and four star journals in there. But but yeah, unless you and this is and this is what happens. And, and it's and these are performative effects. Like mm. I was a, an Oxford studies editor for an associate editor for what a senior editor for 11 years. I don't know how I slipped through the gap. Most people have a three to four year term. We were we were having an Oxford studies workshop in Bordeaux. Uh, that was the year. Oxford is first hit the FT50 list. And Sage was there. They were ecstatic. They were so happy. They were breaking, uh, you know, cracking up 200 euro bottles of wine. They were over the moon. And my first reaction is, oh shit, my workload is going to double. That's exactly what happened. Moment I hit the FT50, I think we would get an average of 450 papers a year. We got 960 the next year. Were they all of good quality per standard? No, they weren't. Most of them were crap. 
But because it hit the FT50, you know, our workload doubled just because of that one ranking. It had, the content was the same. The quality was probably worse, but this is the thing, oh, one more outlet to TMF rank. So it has performative effects in, in many ways. And, and I, I uh, discourage some of the younger stu uh, PhD students when I see them go to the job market. I said, don't just put there, submit it to AMR, submit it to this thing. It's the worst thing you can do. Don't submit something which is not ready to a top journal because word gets out. So it's, it's, be a bit modest, I guess, in terms of where you're going. So the moment they see a, a four-star journal, you will find people sending stuff there, half-baked, not really thought well thought out, just to put on their CV under review under this journal. And that's a that's a really dangerous strategy. People, you guys should think twice before doing that. If I may um, just add one sentence um, to <laughs> what Bobby just was saying. So I think one way, and, and Michael was encouraging sort of, a way forward, a more positive uh, spirit. Uh, so what I'm trying to do with early career researchers and, and colleagues, uh, PhD students alike, is to sort of suggest the thinking in portfolios, right? And I think uh, there yeah. are there is a portfolio of work and there are different audiences, almost like uh, journalists uh, publish their ideas in, in different uh, newspapers or magazines. So I think there is increasingly a, a requirement really to, to educate the younger generation to think in a portfolio, what can go, for instance, in my journal, what can go into uh, some higher level journals, what can be done in order to create the kind of impact. And in one sense, the UK system, I do appreciate it's very performative. Uh, there are performative effects introduced, but one effect, which is, in my view anyway, not completely nonsensical, is this notion of uh, creating impact. And, and when we say impact in the UK, it really is not simply around citation counts. It's around, you know, how do you engage with uh, policy audiences and so on. And there are some interesting metrics, which of course the, in, in, in themselves are also introduced, uh, so encouraging in effect, uh, gaming. There is also that element, certainly, but uh, there is also a positive, potentially positive outcome from the impact agenda in the UK, uh, which feeds into the RRBM uh, agenda somewhat, I would argue. Yeah, thank you, uh, Rudolf. Um, uh, Ron Nasser, are you still here? You want to raise your question? Yeah, uh, Bobby, I, I couldn't agree more uh, about your, your comment at the start that both socialism and capitalism are based on the growth model. Uh, but I was also very taken by uh, your background in, in uh, marketing because I ran an advertising agency for 25 years. And so I, I but I've always been interested in, in looking at consumption patterns. Yeah. And that's why your study of the of the Aboriginal native people, their their lifestyles are totally different. And so I, I just was wondering if you've done research on, on the consumption side, because I just keep thinking you know, it's supply and demand. Hello. Yeah. And it's it's what it's what we consume as, as people. Yeah, it's, I mean this this is actually a dangerous. This is what the fossil fuel industry loves to do, is to put the problem in the individual consumer, right? Without mm -hmm. giving the choices. So this is a dangerous thing. Uh, I have not done marketing, uh, uh, written and marketing consumption for many years now, but I have a colleague Tim Devini, who wrote this book called The Myth of the Ethical Consumer, and it's a well-researched book across the globe. Less than 1% yes. of consumers are what could be termed ethical consumers. Yeah. 99% right. want the same thing, cheap products, good quality, right? That's so right. So expecting that individual, I'm not saying it's not important, of course it is. But the problem is in the political level, it always gets subtly turned on to the consumer. Now, as a choice, yeah. what choice do I have if I have to depend on gas and petroleum? Right, right. What choice are you giving me, right? Uh, yeah. So the real issue is it becomes a deflection tool to move it on to consumption. At one level, so I don't, I don't think green consumption is going to save the world. Uh, I think perhaps non-consumption would be one level. Consumption itself is a problem there. Mm -hmm. So uh, the problem is again who. So somebody talked about the growth. There was a question about the growth thing to want to also address. Yeah, we wrote this thing on special issue on 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 degrowth. It's really a hard one. Now, it's not for everybody. And this is where it becomes uncomfortable. Somebody else talked about, uh, you know, the gatekeeping. It does involve, and it must involve, a decline in the quote unquote standard of living of the rich country. Right. There's right. simply no way out. And people say global north, global south, you know, there are, there are global norths within the global south. India has the maximum number of billionaires in the world, right? There are also global souths in the global north. There was a study done by Oxfam, which basically described England as a poor country with very rich people. <laughs> but they're not too far from the truth. I have a feeling the U.S. is probably like that as well. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Poor country with some very, very rich people, right? So there are yeah. these huge inequalities as well, right? So A, I don't think green consumption is going to change anything. Having said that, I think it does need a, a major regulatory push at one level. And yeah. of course, we do our bit, but suddenly expecting consumption to shift what are huge uh, global trends is, I think, a dangerous way. And it suits the fossil fuel industry to, to play that game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the only thing I would add is it's still uh, just suffer that uh, Gandhian economics has not had the uh, the amount of headlines that it should. Yeah. Um, how about Marty? Marty, you have some comments to make, and maybe Bobby would respond to them. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm a social psychologist uh, and have been uh, a clinical here in Canada. I'm now a humanist chaplain, and I read a lot of these issues and always attend these workshops. I've read Michael Pearson's book. I really loved it. Thanks, Michael. And my view is that we have in our capitalistic uh, world uh, so much uh, uh, that is not promoting an ethic of sharing uh, and even younger people who are frightened of climate change. In my experience, I find that very, very poor people will share because they have nothing to lose and they have not a whole lot to gain other than a friendship or just another meal. But it is done in such small quantities. And then the other people that build these great institutions and building and give huge amounts of money are extremely wealthy people that for 40 or 50 years or their company exploited the masses for many, many years. And then they wanna do penance at the end of their life and they virtue posture. And so they give back. I think that misses the entire middle. Yep. And I would like to see our young people develop a humanistic ethic that says from the very beginning, I must share regardless of where I am in society. And so that's what I talk with my kids about in the courses that I teach, Good. is that it is an ethic of respecting the integrity of everybody at every stage of your life. Even mm -hmm. if you don't have a lot, if you have uh, you have uh, almost nothing, you share. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, that's I, just an, an idea, Bobby. I don't know how you respond to that no, concept. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and one of the great learnings I've had uh, working with indigenous communities uh, particularly in Australia, uh, is that there's an ethics of reciprocity, you know, that uh, they have a very weird notions of property, that right? it's, uh, it's very profoundly different from what we have. So everything is based on reciprocity that, you know, it's, it's, uh, and it goes beyond the gift giving thing which we do in the West. It's much more profound than that. Um, I'm going to give you an example. I used to work in this remote community and there's a the old man's traditional elder once came and said, can you just give me 20 bucks? So I was fine, I gave him 20 bucks. The next day he came and asked me, can you give me 20 bucks? I said, I just gave you yesterday. He said, yeah, but somebody needed it, so I gave it to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I actually saw him that day. He was walking and somebody said, can I have it? He just gave it all. Mm -hmm. You know, no. <laughs> Think of, so that is the, the relationship, not the transaction. For me, giving a 20, I didn't expect it back. It was fine, but that's a transaction. He giving it away for just a random person who wants it is a relationship at one level, right? And that for me was a profound understanding of what we think of property. A lot of indigenous people don't have that view. Uh, and sometimes they get into trouble for it because they think it's theirs. It's collective and they use it and then they get into trouble because quote unquote, they haven't bought it. You know, they don't own it, so to speak. So yeah, I couldn't agree more on uh, ethics of care or reciprocity. And that goes to not just between human beings, but also with the non-human the same kind of relationship we should have with the land, with, with the mountain, with the rivers, with the trees, right? With the rocks. So if you had that, then we wouldn't be in the mess we're in right now. Um, so um, there's two more questions that I'd like to get to. One is from Gerard and the other is from, um, well, it's more of a comment, but Pat, uh, well, it was a couple more actually. Patty and, uh, where'd they go? Patsy and Richard. So uh, Gerard, do you wanna quickly ask your question? Sure, sure, thanks Andrew, thanks for calling on me. Uh, Bobby, I've raised this question with you before, but I think I, I'll, I'll keep persisting because uh, it's, it's really the, you know, what is happening in the world out there? And we have persisted on questions of where we publish, how we mm -hmm. publish, but 
how I think the key issue is how do we translate this in terms of scale, scope, and urgency to what is happening in the world out there? We, I, at least from all that we see, and I think everyone here would agree, we are on a, in a crisis mode right now. I mm -hmm. don't think there's any doubt about that. And it needs a tremendous sense of urgency, really a global revolution. And when, when you're talking about it in terms of, uh, yeah, the issue with capitalism, et cetera, uh, we've been talking about paradigm shifts and things like that and for decades now, but we still seem to be stuck within our current ways of doing things, including in academia and the question of publishing and all these kinds of things. Isn't it time for us to get out of our ivory tower and and be out there on the streets? Otherwise, we're not going to solve this. Yeah. Yeah, Thanks, think, Gerard. Yeah, yeah, I think that time has passed. I think that, that should have happened 15, 20 years ago. Uh, but yeah, the question is, you know, as a normative question, yes, but how? Um, and again, uh, this would be suicide for a PhD student to say this in my generation. I do have PhD students who basically tell me, I don't want to be in academia. I don't want to waste my right, writing a paper which six people will read. I want my PhD, I want to do something different. These, and I basically tell them, don't say this in the department. Nobody will work with you. Just keep it quiet. Do what you have to do. Yeah, and I've got, I didn't supervise this person. I was her examiner. She, has, she works for a think tank. Somebody else is working for an NGO. Uh, one, one is working for the United Nations thinking that she can change it from the inside. So these are non-traditional academic uh, careers. And I, and I don't blame them. I mean, things have gone so, especially in the UK, if you're, and I'm sorry, I don't want to demotivate young uh, scholars from the UK. I'm looking at my the people, the situation right now, and I think, thank God I'm old. Imagine starting off your academic career in the UK in a time like this. The goalposts are shifting every year. You're, you know, you're expecting our PhD students to have AMRs and AMJs when they come out you know, the most ridiculous expectations and then apply for grants in every way. So, uh, and, and the work pressures are just intolerable in terms of what, what we're asking young people to do. So yeah, absolutely, the, getting up, but, but how? On the streets, yes. I mean, I say, and this is, I mean, the, this is the way I kind of sustain myself is I'm also a teacher, right? Let's not forget, I'm primarily a teacher. I make a difference every day in my classroom. Maybe 20 people read my paper. The real difference happens is the, continuous cohort of 19, 20 year olds and also the PhDs whom I teach, right? That's the only thing which I can say, okay, this is what I guess it might be ivory tower, but these are people who are coming out. And I see my role as a business school professor, not as, I don't see my role as educating the next generation of CEOs or senior managers. I don't see my role as educating the next generation of people that will cause, you know, hedge fund managers will cause the next crisis. Uh, that, you know, you can go to Howard and Yale for that. I see my role as educating the next generation of activists, of policymakers, of political leaders, you know, maybe the next CEO of Greenpeace, who knows? I see that that as my primary role. Yeah. I have I teach a climate change module for undergraduates. I have Extinction Rebellion give a talk in my class. I ask them to recruit from my class. I have Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter people come and talk to my class, right? This is an undergraduate module in a business school, right? So, so yeah, those are the kind of things which is in my power to do. And yeah, I've been fortunate I haven't been fired yet to do that. But then we use whatever level of power we have. When I, when uh, David, David Kurpasson, uh, editor in chief, asked me to be senior at Oxford Study, which is a lot of work, as you know, and Charlene will, will know that. I told David very clearly, you know my stuff, you know my work. Oxford Studies is a mainstream journal, right? It's not some left wing radical journal at all. But I said, if a mainstream paper comes across my desk, I don't care how good it is, I'm going to reject it. Go somewhere else. There's plenty. If a critical paper comes across my desk, I'll at least send it out for review. Probably reject it after that, but at least I'll send it out for review because they never had the chance before. So, and so Bobby, yeah. Bobby, I, we're going to have to wrap this up. And I wanted to get to Richard and Patsy, okay. or, or Patsy, I don't know who it is, but um, okay. but I also want to point out that um, um, Anne Sui is suggesting an open letter calling for change, signed by thousands of academics. Go for it, Anne. I'll yeah. sign it. And uh, Michael has a manifesto that he's pointed to. So uh, Richard or Patsy, I don't know which of you is I'm, here. I'm Richard or Marins, my, my, my bad. I'll try to be brief uh, out of character, but um, just quickly, I wanna point out uh, regarding what Michael had said, 
you really don't know where you're going to find tolerance. I found a lot more tolerance on the job market at Jesuit schools than just about anywhere else. And also, even to some extent, elite schools where you do have a certain amount of, uh, of uh, pluralism tolerance, I would say, because of self-confidence. Um, on the other hand, some very uh, number of schools that were way down the list, I have found been very, you know, very concerned about the label of being anti-business. I want to segue that the other comment about my uh, difficulty with the term critical. I think it's become a form of ghettoization. I didn't like it when it started in 1999, but felt I had no choice, partly because what I experienced wasn't so much a lack of criticality, at least in the US schools, at least in the sim division type work where I was mostly focused on as a grad student, uh, was simply a lack of scholarship that given a choice between following the empirical record and making uh, top management, typical top management of American corporations look either bad or hypocritical, the choice was always in favor of avoidance or simple studied ignorance. This drove me crazy. Um, and uh, so it was necessary, but the problem with being, being labeled critical is it, is it walks in the room with an inherently anti, supposed inherently anti-business approach. And it's almost a warning flag. Uh, it would be better, to, I think a, a more conventional critique can be made and can also be effective. And I'll shut I, up. I think that's, thank you, Richard. I think we're gonna have to shut down. So Bobby, do you wanna have one last word here? Just, just about- Running to Richard. Yeah, well, in terms of, first of all, aren't we all supposed to be critical? I don't get that. We're supposed That's to be it. How can you? How can you be a non-critical scholar? You're not a scholar in that case, right? But I think the issue of yeah, CMS uh, when critical management was first formed, somebody asked me to sign. I said I thought it was a joke. I said critical management. That's my favorite oxymoron. Like uh, <laughs> displaced like CSR. <laughs> yeah. So CSR my oxymoron. Sustainable development another oxymoron. Military intelligence. You know, you one could go on. <laughs> but 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 yeah, I just the fact that that. Uh, this has now become another ghetto, a privileged ghetto, is quite, I, I experienced it myself. Before CMS was formed, when I used to trash some of the big names in the field, people would engage with my argument. Yeah, okay, this is not the way and they would engage. Now, we said, Bobby Banerjee, CMS, no point. I mean, engage with a goddamn argument, right? So they would, there was a lot better engagement with my critiques, for example, of stakeholder theory and CSR, where I have critics of very big names, but they were responding to my critique, not responding to what they thought my ideology was. You know? And that's now become a problem with this box. And that's one thing, again, the Americans do very well, as Foucault has taught us, the best way to manage resistance is to let it happen. So they put a box around CMS, they put a box around gender, and say, oh, look at us, we're so inclusive. We've got all these people doing this. Nobody talks to each other. And I've pissed off a lot of my CMS colleagues uh, uh, in the past, in, in the academy. Last year, I pissed them off this year. I said, you should not be here at CMS. You really want to make a difference? Go to every OMT session. Go to every uh, BPS session and disrupt that session intellectually. That's what you do. And Bobby, that's what you do so well. And that's why we are so glad that you were able to join us today. And I know we're about five minutes past time here. So um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you uh, to the EMA team for all the help that you, you do in the background and Michael. Um, there's a ton of stuff in the chat. It will be sent to all people who registered and the uh, video will be posted in a couple of days, I believe. So thank you everyone. Thanks everybody. Have a good weekend. Thank you everybody.